Well, that's some good preaching, isn't it? <laughs> great, great stuff. It's been a great journey over the last 14 weeks. Uh, studying through the books of First and Second Thessalonians, I trust that you've uh, gleaned uh, some practical application from God's Word. It's been uh, really the theme has been uh, hope in light of the returning King. Uh, fact is, Jesus is coming back again. Did you hear me say that? Jesus is coming back again, and in light of that, go ahead. That's something to thank God for. In light of that, it should affect every area of our life. And the Apostle Paul takes First and Second Thessalonians to explain to these new believers who've just given their lives to Christ. The Apostle Paul only spent about three weeks with them, and yet they've given their lives to Christ, and he's teaching them how awesome it is to wait for the return of Jesus and really how to live their life in, in, in light of that. And the fact is, it changes things if we know, if we all knew today is going to be our last day to live, it would change something. It, it really would. Uh, it, it would probably change phone calls we would make today. It, it would change people that we visit today. It would change decisions and actions that we would take today. Uh, might change what we have to lunch to, for, for lunch today. If it's my last day, it's bacon and ice cream, all right? <laughs> Uh, bacon and ice cream, that'd be my last meal. Maybe not together, but I assure you, they're going to they fit in there somewhere. But it would change something. And, and when these people heard that Jesus Christ is coming back again, uh, not all of their actions were good. Some of them stopped doing what they should be doing. They, some of them actually stopped working in their life. And they just sat back and relaxed. Well, if Jesus is coming back soon, I can quit my job. I'll just wait. Well, it's interesting, as we read this passage today, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, whether you're in the room or whether you're watching online, I want to ask you to turn your Bibles there with me, or you can open up your Bible apps on your phones, or you can Google 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading in verse 6 in just a minute, and I want to talk to you about a theology of work. Did you hear that word? A theology of work. It's a subject I've never preached before in my life. A biblical theology of work. I remember my first job. Do you remember yours? Some of you are still waiting on it. <laughs> I remember my first job. I couldn't have been much more than 12 years of age. I had a, a little... Uh, Honda CT50. And I could get on that little motorcycle and ride over to my uncle and aunt's house, my uncle Frank and Aunt Idell. And Frank, Uncle Frank was a World War II veteran. And for a living, he made little cement or concrete uh, things to put in your yard. He had bird baths that he would make out of concrete. He had swans and flower pots with big grape clusters on the sides. You've seen those, haven't you? It's likely, I, I don't, I've never known anybody else who made those. If you have seen those in the last 40 years in somebody's yard, it's likely my Uncle Frank made it. He had a small little concrete shop, little block building behind his house. Tied up out in front of that was a large Great Dane dog and there were chickens all around the building that flowed in and out of that building while we worked. And my Uncle Frank invited me to work with him one summer. He said, I need some help. At that age, I didn't know what I could do because all that stuff was extremely heavy. I would watch him strain as he would pick those things up, mix concrete, shovel sand, shovel cement mix, use a saw to cut iron rods that would go inside those swan necks so they didn't break in time. All those were small details that I watched on the, on the backside of, of the product. And he said, what I need you to do, Todd, is I, I, need, I need you when I finish one of these and I open up that mold, there's going to be cement seepage that has dried on the edge 
of that mold. And I need you to take this hammer and I need you to take this chisel. I need you to get all that dried seepage off of there and completely clean that mold. And it was extremely slick on the inside. It was coated in a, in a unique burgundy red on the inside. And there was concrete stuck on the outside, but it was as clean as it could be on the inside. And I, I'll never forget. He said, every spot of that red I want you to take a paintbrush and you take this mixture of oil and diesel fuel and you're going to paint every square inch of that mold on the inside. And it's very important because if any part of that doesn't have some of that mixture on it, then the cement is going to stick to the mold. And when I take the mold off, I'm going to have to throw that one away. Extremely important that you cover every spot. And I remember watching that first time as he popped open that mold and unbolted, took the bolts off of that and popped it open. And I'm looking to make sure that nothing stuck. And man, how awesome and fulfilling it felt when even those little small intricate grapes on the side of that big flower pot was all together and nothing was broken. The fulfillment at 12 years of age to see the product of the work of my own hands. I, I've never gotten over it. Uh, through the years, I, I've made things, created things. I remember in high school, I made my wife uh, a hope chest. We still have it in our attic with all kinds of important things in it. And I made that in shop for her. I also made a gun cabinet that my brother has to this day. I made it with my hands. It's part of the creation of my heart, my mind, my work, my toil. I've now just completed my third book. And when I hold up one of those books, for a lot of people, they might say that's a good book or it's not such a good book or it helped me or I didn't like it. But for me, I'm fulfilled. I can't, I can't tell you how many times. I pick up a book my first book from 2008. Oh, when I read it, I'm almost embarrassed at the quality of the writing. But I look at it, and it has my name on it. And I wrote those words. And God gave me the ability, and God produced something creatively through me. And every time I've created something or worked on a project to look at it and feel the, the fulfillment I'm knowing I worked with my hands. I'm talking today about a theology of work. Let's begin in verse 6 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. You ready for the word? Say, I am. The Apostle Paul writes, Now we, who's we? That's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We have learned in our study. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from every brother who walks irresponsibly and not according to the tradition received from us. What in the world is he talking about? People who walk irresponsibly. We all can conjecture a thought in our mind of what irresponsibly would mean. He describes who it is. For you yourselves know how you must imitate us. We were not irresponsible among you. Then he describes how they were not irresponsible. We did not eat anyone's bread free of charge. Instead, we labored and toiled, working. What, what's that word again? Working. working. One more time. Everyone, working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. It is not that we don't have the right to support, but we did it to make ourselves an example to you so that you would imitate us. Imitate us how? In fact, you'll remember when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. Quote, if anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat, end quote. For we hear that there are some among you who walk irresponsibly, not working at all, but interfering with the work of others. Now we command and exhort such people by the Lord Jesus Christ that quietly working, they may eat their own bread. 
brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take note of that person. Don't associate with him so that he may be ashamed. We use other words. Uh, shameful words describe people who aren't willing to work. Uh, we use words like deadbeat, uh, shyster, mooch, sponge, <laughs> leech, barnacle. <laughs> it's all kind of words. You say, all oh, that's shameful. It is. But it's not near as shameful as the act of not being willing to work. It's a word that goes along with it. And he used that word, ashamed, ashamed. Wow, that's a powerful word. Let these people feel ashamed if they're, if they're not willing to work. He said, don't associate with them, let them feel ashamed. Yet don't treat him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother if he's a believer. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with all of you. This greeting is in my own hand, Paul said, and he gives his name, Paul. This is a sign in every letter. This is how I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. The theology of work. This letter written some 50 or 51 A.D., to the people in the city of Thessalonica was extremely pertinent, but it is just as pertinent today. Why was it pertinent then? Why is it pertinent today? Then, because in the Greco-Roman culture, these Thessalonians, though they had given their lives to Christ just a year or so earlier, the apostle Paul is trying to teach them what it means to be a Christian. He couldn't hand them a Bible. There were no Bibles. He's writing the New Testament. <laughs> God is using him in that manner. That's why he uses such strong language. We command you, we command you. It's not a suggestion, I command you, he says. And just like we see God's word as commands from God, he's giving them commands, and now we find them in the text. To these new believers, the apostle Paul, you would think he would only address theology, or he might only address immorality. Or he might only address basic values that we see in church life or how to carry on church life. But here he saves this hot button topic for last in his subject and in his book by talking about work, either our willingness to work or our unwillingness to work. And he refers to it as a big deal, not a small thing. Why is it such a big deal and why was it such a struggle then? Because in the Greco-Roman period, people in those days from the Greek culture influenced predominantly actually believed, according to the Greek philosopher Homer, that work was a curse from the gods. The gods must hate humanity because they watch while requiring humanity to work and toil and labor. They saw work not as a good thing, but as a bad thing. Not as a blessing, but as a curse. The apostle Paul knew he had to get that out of these believers if he's going to ever help them learn what it's like to be a follower of Jesus Christ because work is a Christian value. You need to understand that. If you say, I'm a Christian, then you need to learn how to enjoy work and laboring with your hands and laboring with your life and investing your life to do labor and work throughout your life. It's a part of the journey. It's, it's as important as reading your Bible. It's, it's like praying. It's like telling somebody about Jesus. The Apostle Paul highlights work ethic right up there among the highest of all Christian values in this text. And yet for many of us, we would see it as not an issue at all. But for them, they saw it as a curse. Now, he used himself as an example. He said, you can follow what we did. For the time we were with you, just live the way we lived. We got up and went to work every day. 
We toiled and labored among you. We not only had Bible study with you, but we toiled and we labored. We provided for our own food. We made our own bread. We didn't come into your houses and take what was yours. We tried to do so as an example. I know we were your guests. You, were, you would been, have been hospitable to us. You would have provided for us, but we refused to accept it. We chose to work and provide for ourselves while we were there, not because lawfully we couldn't have received your gifts of food, but we wanted to show you what it's like to work for a living and provide for yourselves. And we did it as an example. Therefore, imitate us in this manner. Now today, in our culture, in what we some refer to as the new America, before our very eyes, we are watching the virtue of work disappear before us. Many have grown up with a great work ethic. Matter of fact, the generation before me, my parents and grandparents, work was automatic. As a matter of fact, you knew you were going to work because you didn't actually work for money. My grandparents and great-grandparents in their earlier years did not work for money. They worked for food. And they often bartered the food they grew on their farms for food that other people had in their farms. And they had large families and they worked and toiled together. My grandmother took me to the field where uh, Harrelson County Middle School is now. I remember there was a massive oak tree out there and there was an old barn out there near Beach Creek on Highway 120, halfway between Tallapoosa, Georgia and Buchanan. I stood there with my grandmother in her 70s and she walked over under that tree and she said, right here's where I used to play as a little girl. She said, my daddy had his mule and his wagon in the barn. And there's the remnants of that old barn. I remember seeing the remnants of that barn. I remember her turning and looking back toward Beach Creek and the small dirt road that branched off. And you could still ford the creek at that time. And she said, over there where those trees are, all the way to that hill over there, it was a large field. And she said, I, I, I couldn't, been, couldn't have been more than eight or nine years of age, and we used to pick cotton all over that field, my brothers and sisters and I. She said, I remember my granddaddy coming out there. My, her granddaddy had fought and served in the Civil War. He had lost his left eye in the Civil War, and he was an old-aged man. And here she is out there with her granddaddy and said he would be out there with them. And he said, she said he would feel sorry for us kids out there having to work in that field in the heat. And we were so small, and he would get frustrated that Daddy made us work so hard in that field. And he'd come out there and just stand with us in the field, even though I wasn't, wasn't able. And she said, I never will forget him saying after really got, got really hot during the day, he'd say, listen, girls, listen. I think I hear your mama calling me. And she, saw, she said, we all knew he was hard to hear it and couldn't hear a thing. He just wanted to get out of the sun for a while. And he'd hobble off back up to the house. That was the life for all people in rural America for many, many years. Today, we have a fairly comfortable life. We look to a day where we may not have to work anymore, sometime where we can stop toiling with our hands and we no longer feel the pressure of providing for our meals. Even the Lord taught us in the Lord's Prayer that we should pray, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, give us this day, this day. Most of us feel like we're not doing very well at all if we have several years of preparation out there. We, we don't like the feeling of say, feeling like I have to work today to provide for what I'm going to have. Um, we're watching our work ethic disappear. We're, a part of that is, I'll just say it, God doesn't matter in our lives much anymore as, as a whole in our nation. The Bible doesn't matter. So if God doesn't matter, then Morality doesn't matter. And if morality doesn't matter, values don't matter. And if values don't matter, then it doesn't matter if you steal. It doesn't matter whether or not you work. It doesn't matter if you destroy somebody's property. It doesn't matter. Just whatever matters is do what's right in your own eyes for this moment in time. And that's what matters. Whatever makes me happy for right now, regardless of what it costs someone else. And that's much of what we're watching unfold before our eyes in our very generation right now. Our government hasn't helped this issue very much in recent weeks and months over the last couple of years. I realize we've 
gone through a time period where we didn't know what COVID was going to be. I remember walking in all of that just as sometimes cautious and fearful, unknowing what's around the corner as much as you. I remember all of that. I remember us announcing we we're not going to have gatherings like this for a while. I remember a phone call from our governor. I remember meeting with pastors. I remember talking to all kinds of people. And I, I remember saying what we're going to do and then sometimes doing something different because circumstances changed. Um, I, I remember during that period of time feeling depressed. I, I remember going through not just weeks but months where I had nothing to do. Nothing. Nobody wanted me around. There was nobody to see. You didn't get a hug from anybody. Nobody could hug you. You couldn't shake anybody's hand. If you did see somebody, you had on a mask. There was nothing to produce. I, I did preach a sermon or do some communications online, and you, you folks would watch online, and I, I came here and preached to a completely empty building. But even that seemed so unfulfilling at the moment. And I remember battling depression in my own life. And I knew Jesus, and I know where I'm going when I die. But I remember battling that. I looked at my wife, and I said, I feel like I'm dying on the inside. And nobody wants me around. I said, I'm not getting exercise. I'm gaining weight. I, no, 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 none of you gain weight, I know. <laughs> she said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I, you're going to laugh. But I said, I think I'm going to buy me a coon dog again, just like I had when I was a teenager, and I'm going to hit the woods at night. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> and that's how I got my exercise, because I could do that with nobody else around. Nobody cared what I was doing after midnight. <laughs> my point is this. There's some who had not found a way back to work yet. Because after a while, if you get used to getting your needs met, without anybody, without working for it. After a while, you start saying, how can I keep on living that way? I sort of like that. And our government system has sort of helped people get, stay stuck. I know it's a, it's a hard challenge sometimes to know exactly what to do and how to do it, and that's what some of them are in also. But we face the same thing regarding church life. Um, some people at covid it changed their entire system of living. And there are people who are here every week, and some have never come back at all. Matter of fact, some of you are watching online, and you got used to staying at home in your pajamas. <laughs> and if you're at home within 5 or 10 or 15 miles of here, and you're healthy, and this is your church, you ought to be here, not just watching online. Now, we have our line online. And I will say we believe in our online system and process. We have people in different states. We have people around the world. We have life groups online. We have prayer meetings online. It's a marvelous tool. We have people who can't be at church. We have people who work at, uh, on Sundays. I, I talked to an airline pilot this morning. He said, I'm glad to be here today, but because most of the time I have to watch online. It's there for that. But I just want to say to you, God designed us to work, and God designed us to worship together in the body of Christ. There's no substitute for corporate worship. You, you, can't, you can't get at home what you're going to get right here. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I watched myself during that period of time because a lot of it was recorded, and I sat in my pajamas on Saturday morning, and it felt on Sunday morning, and it felt good. I thought, I'm going to feel what they feel. I'm going to watch church in my pajamas. I'm going to get me a cup of coffee. It feels nice. It felt nice. I understand the lure. But after a while, I'm going to tell you, it was killing me on the inside because God created us for something more. Now, the Apostle Paul addresses this clearly in this text, and I'm going to give you three basic things, three basic things this morning. Number one, here's what you need to get. Work is good. I'm going to say it again. Work is good. Work is good. good. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing. As a matter of fact, you talk to some people who are disabled today who can't work, and they would love to be able to work. We have people in our own church fellowship. It's hard, the complications they have in their physical bodies. It is literally hard, and some of them try to get jobs, and they can't with their limited abilities make 
a living with what they can get paid because of what they can do. And you can see the battle. You can see the depression and the frustration and the disappointment and the heartache. So if you're able-bodied, you ought to be willing to work. Work is good. How do we know work is good? Let me give you four ways we know work is good. Paul, Silas, and Timothy worked as an example to follow. That's how we know work was good. Paul said, when we were with you, we worked so you could watch us know how to do it. That must have been a good thing. You know what else they probably taught them how to do? Pray. Pray like we prayed. Study like we study. Talk to God the way we talk to God. Share your faith the way we share our faith. And work the way we worked. It's a virtue. It's a part of living the Christian life. Get up every day and go to work if you're able not only do we know that Paul, Silas, and Timothy worked as an example to follow, but secondly, God himself is a worker. Do you know that? God is a worker. Uh, creation. Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. Listen to this. Genesis 2, verse 3. 1 through 3. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed by the seventh day, God completed his, that's oh, about six of you. God completed his what? Word. All right. That he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his Word. that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy for on it he rested from his Word. of creation. Now in chapter one of Genesis in verse 28, here's what it says. A lot of people think that work You've heard it. Well, if Adam and Eve hadn't ate that apple, <laughs> we wouldn't have to work because they perceive work as a curse, one of the consequences of sin. But what I'm about to read you was before the curse. It says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. Now, look over in chapter 2 and verse 15. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. That's before the fall. That's before they ate the apple. <laughs> That's before the sin. Work wasn't a part of consequences for sin. Work was a purpose for our existence. God himself worked, created, and it was all good. And then he made man in his own image, which was to work. So if you're not working, producing something somewhere, somehow, you're missing out on something and you may be lacking, you may feel lacking in your life about purpose and drive and you may have all the money in the bank you need, you may draw all the money through the mail that you need, you may have all the food in your cupboard and all the food in your freezer you need, but I'm telling you, unless you are producing something, doing something to add value to this world and to people's lives, you're going to feel less than God intended you to feel about life. Not only is God a worker, but Jesus is a worker. John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. John 5, 17, Jesus responded to them, My father is still working and I am still working. And in this world, when Jesus came, he didn't just come and hang around. He didn't come wear some kind of a religious cloak or anything. He's a carpenter. He's building with his hands. We, we sometimes have this mindset, as the Greeks did and the Romans had, that there were two kinds of, of, of work. Really, work itself, physical labor, was sort of reserved for slaves, servants, the uneducated, and the lower class. It, it sort of reminds me today, we have this, these labels in our culture we call... Uh, White collar, blue collar. White collar, blue collar. Th those are awful labels. Because you're going to learn the Bible says whatever you do, 
Whatever work you do, do as unto the Lord. Dr. King said, if you're scrubbing a toilet, you ought to be the best toilet scrubber there is. If you're a janitor, I'll never forget one of my earlier year jobs. I went there to be a pastor, to be a bus minister director, and they're going to call me Pastor Todd, you know, the little boys and girls as I'm running a bus ministry. I had five bus routes all over Augusta, Georgia. I was there only a month or two, and the church began declining, facing some financial challenges, and I'll never forget, Pastor, give me a promotion. I became janitor. Yeah, Pastor Todd dressed up in a three-piece suit in those days on Sundays. Now, all of a sudden, I'm the janitor and custodian, not only of the church, but of the private Christian school that we had. We had about 300 kids. We went all the way through high school, and I was the guy that had 14 to 16 tables of high schoolers eating lunch after bean battles and pea battles. I'm the guy that got to clean all that up. And I, I've got a bucket and I've got soap and I've got a, a rag and I'm wiping down tables. Hadn't been that long since I was out of high school. I didn't sign up for all this. Those seniors in high school only three or four years younger than I were. I was at the time. And I'm wiping down those tables. By Wednesday night, that transformed into a worship center of about 350 people. I'd take down all those tables, all those chairs. I had to mop that building from one end. It was a gymnasium. I had to mop it from one end to the other. I was the mopper, not one of the moppers. I was the mopper. <laughs> I can sling a mop, buddy, I guarantee you. I can cover some territory. <laughs> Once a month, it had to be spray buffed with a buffer. Oh, I still had my bus routes on Saturday. Y'all all right? Five bus routes on Saturday and Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. I made a wholesome $200 a week, benefits and all. There were no benefits, <laughs> just $200. That's what I got. And I'm going to tell you, you say, wasn't that humiliating? Wasn't that humbling? Oh, yeah, sure it is. But here's what I've learned. It was also fulfilling because I could look back. I could be there by myself. I could finish mopping all that floor and buffing that entire floor. I could look back, and I'm going to tell you, it's like I was back in Uncle Frank's shop once again, looking out over all that. And when the, when the lights would glare on that floor, I could look across there, and I could tell you if I missed a spot. Man, it looked good to just stand back there. And nobody else may ever know, but I could look back across it, and I could say, it is good. Just like God looked at the universe after six days and said, it is good. There's something special about looking at the work of our hands and our labor and looking back and observing it and no, no one else may notice. We look back and say, it's good. That's a feeling you're not going to get from anything else in this world. Why? Because God created us for that, <laughs> to produce something, to do something. And I can hold up that book and say, it's good. You may not like it, but I'm just telling you, I'll argue with you. It's good. Created it. Holy Spirit's also a worker, by the way. Uh, the Bible says when we give our life to Jesus, he comes to live inside of us and he works. When people say, God's doing a work on me, God's, God's been dealing with me, God's been convicting me, God has been teaching me, God has been helping me, God's been... Uh, challenging me. What are we saying? We're, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit today is God with us. It isn't some being off in the heavens someday, somewhere. It's God here right now. He's living on the inside. And when he stirs inside of us, he draws us into a relationship with Christ and he convicts us of our sin. He comforts us, encourages us, teaches us. That's his job. He's working. Work is good. It's not bad. Second thing you'll notice is those unwilling to work must have consequences. Did you get that? Those unwilling to work must have consequences. You see that beginning in verse 10. It says, in fact, when we were with you, this is what we commanded you. If anyone isn't willing to work, he should not eat. And we hear there's some among you who walk irresponsibly, not working at all, but interfering with the work of, of others. We command you by the Lord Jesus Christ, who's a worker, by the way, that quietly working, they may eat their own bread. Go do something. Um, I, I have loved, you saw what we were part of this weekend and 
what we're part of every week, by the way, and you're part of, our Lifeline ministry is, is run largely by people who are what we call retired. Now, what does retired means, mean for a Christian? That means you have the privilege of working free doing something. You can find something somewhere to do. Now, it might not be the same schedule, and you, you may play four days of golf, and, and you may have fish on another day, but I assure you, after a while, you can only play so much golf and have, and have fun in this world. I love playing golf. You can only hunt so much. I love to hunt, but you can only hunt so much and, 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 have, and, and be fulfilled and purposeful. At some point, at some point, you're going to have to find somewhere, somehow, to add value to someone else other than yourself or you're going to feel like life slipping away from you. And as long as you and I are able, that's why it's so vitally important. We, we, have, uh, we had the gathering yesterday with all the supplies. We have the food. We have the clothing. And every week we have business people. Many of them have been highly successful. They've run companies, run business, run stores, educators. But they get paid from their retirement. And they volunteer. They're some of the happiest people I know. <laughs> I'll see them down there. They're like teenagers down there. You can come watch sometimes while, while they're serving. They're cutting up with each other and just having a ball. And a lot of the responsibilities of having to work are over because that's not required anymore. But they know the value and importance of continuing to invest their life in something that matters. And those who are unwilling to work must have consequences. Um, if you keep bailing out people who simply won't work, you're harming those people, not helping those people. Harming them, doing them damage, taking away their self-worth, taking away their self-esteem, taking away their value of what, what, what they're going to feel about life and about God and about God's provision because it is still, I don't care what you say, it's still more blessed to give than to receive. And if you don't work to give something, you're going to be missing out on some of the greatest blessings of life because there's this other Christian virtue called charity, so vitally important. That's where we help take care of and feed and clothe and minister to those who cannot work or who are unable to work or they are working, but it just isn't enough. We're living in a time where grandparents are often raising grandkids and what they have coming in just isn't enough. I watch car after car after car after car of senior adults come by getting their boxes of groceries every week. We give away, I think last week, about 280 families, if I'm not mistaken, 280 families last week, their groceries for the week. And that's not just one week, that's every week. Every week, over 200 families. Did you get that? It doesn't cost them a dime. If you're struggling, we'll help you. But if you're able-bodied, you get up tomorrow and go to work. If you don't have a job, get it tomorrow and let your work be going and put in applications. I know Chick-fil-A's hiring. He's had it on Facebook. Come on, see us. Come see us. Come see us. Come see us. David's sitting back there shaking his head. Yeah, you got a new store opening up, about to open up next Thursday, Thursday. God's chicken. <laughs> Go help produce it. Can't tell you how many business owners. I've got, a, I've got a friend that says, I'm looking for help in my business. I can't find people to work. The, the rise in crime that we're facing in our country would be cut probably by 80 to 90% if those individuals had a job. Because you don't feel like goofing off and doing something dumb when you've been working all day. A lot of that stuff happens at night. So you won't be ramming around at night. I share with my youngest brother. I got I to finish. But my youngest brother, you've been so kind to ask about last week. This past week, he got to hand out his Bibles. What a, what a, what a blessing. Uh, I share with you the, the story. Many of you know the story. You've prayed for me and prayed for him. 
God's not finished. He just keeps on doing great stuff. Many, many years in prison. He's been clean from any kind of substance, drug substance. Now for four months, he says it's the longest he's been clean since he's 14 or 15 years of age. He's 53. He handed out over 30 Hispanic Bibles this week to every employee in the company he's working for. About 12 English Bibles. We had the privilege, they brought all the employees together in one break room, told them to get up there and give his testimony about what Jesus is doing in his life. Here's, (laughs) he don't make a massive salary. He said, I'm making less than I've ever worked probably in my life, but I, he said, I'm, I'm enjoying life. I'm happier than I've ever been. It's not in all the stuff, but he's producing something. He, he calls every, every day. I, I share with you several times a day. <laughs> he calls, tell me what he's doing, what he's seeing, how God's using him. You see, when you and I work, it, it's special. It's what a privilege it is. It's a privilege. I'll finish with this. There's a third point. Work is a Christian virtue. Work is a Christian virtue. I'm gonna give you some Bible verses to prove it. Colossians chapter three and verse 28 says this. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men. Go to work tomorrow. Tomorrow's Monday. Don't get up and say, Monday, it's Monday. Oh man, it's Monday again. It's Monday again. I used to work with a lady like that. I'd walk in on, Sunday, on, on Monday mornings and say hello to her and Miss Judy. She must have been mean as a rattlesnake at home because she sure was at work. <laughs> but I'd go in and say, good morning, Miss Judy. <gasps> don't say good morning to me. No, don't, don't even talk to me until at least, at least lunchtime. That's somebody who don't understand what a privilege it is to get up every day. It, it's privilege. Get up tomorrow. If you're a Christian, get up tomorrow. Your witness depends on this. Get up tomorrow and you smile and thank God for another day, for the privilege of doing something for him. You're not just working for that company. You're working for God. And there's no white collar, blue collar if it's done for him. It's all powerful and purposeful and meaningful. Psalm 128 verse 2 says, you will surely eat what your hands have worked for and you'll be happy and it'll go well for you. 1 Corinthians 10 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Proverbs 16 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be achieved. Proverbs 21 25. A slacker's craving will kill him because his hands refuse to work. Work is good. And all God's people said? Let me ask you, bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, thank you for the time we've had together today studying your word. We celebrate. Thank you for giving us the privilege of creating, of working, of doing something with our life. May that continue to be a reality for all of us. Give us all meaningful work. If we're retired, if we're slowing down, if our bodies are failing, still give us, give us meaningful opportunities so we can carry out our purpose. Now, some of you have never been saved. You've never given your life to Jesus. I want to pray with you, and I'm going to ask you to meet with some folks in just a minute outside this door here to, to receive a book to get you, get you started right. But here's the prayer. Give your life to Jesus. Call upon him this way. Just tell him this. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Today I receive you as my Lord and Savior and I surrender all to you. If you're praying that prayer and that's your decision and that's your journey today, as you depart to my left, to your right, beside the stage, There's some folks out there that will help you get started right as a new believer and have a booklet to help you walk alongside you in that journey. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.